Hello everyone, thank you all for joining us today for this Lunch and Learn session to hear an introduction and an overview of non-viral vector systems. My name is Carmen Onsu, I am a principal investigator at the Center for Applied Medical Research, University of Navarra, Spain, where I work developing AV vectors for gene therapy. I'm also a member of the ASCCT Patient Outreach Committee. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing about non-viral vectors from Dr. Lauren Woodard, Dr. Lauren Woodard is an assistant professor of medicine in the division of nephrology and hypertension at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She also has a secondary appointment in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Vanderbilt University and is a research health scientist at the Nashville VA. Dr. Woodard completed her PhD in Dr. Michael Kalos lab at Stanford on the safety and utility of phage integrases for non-viral gene therapy. Next, she completed her postdoc fellowship in Dr. Matthew Wilson's lab at Baylor College of Medicine, where she studied transposon systems, including piggyback and TC Buster. Her lab at Vanderbilt, at Vanderbilt engineers gene and cell therapies for kidney regeneration. They're testing gene-modified stem cells and their exosomes in both mouse and human organoid models of kidney injury. So we are delighted to have her sharing about this topic today. Just as a quick reminder, please don't forget to submit your questions during this session using the chat feature on the left, and we'll go through them during the Q&A time. So Dr. Vural, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Carmen. I'm very excited to talk to all of you today about non-viral vectors. This is a topic I've studied for my entire career, and so um, there's a lot of ground to cover, actually, in this area. Um, so here's an outline of what we will talk about today. First, we'll start with what is a non-viral vector and then get into um, some of the vectorology that's available. So starting with plasmid DNA, covering mini circles, and then integrating systems, including integrase and transposons. I'll touch on gene editing systems as well as RNA. And then we'll talk some about delivery methods. So what's the difference between in vivo versus ex vivo? and get into chemical versus physical methods of delivery. And throughout the discussion, I'm gonna be talking about some of the technical challenges and limitations of different gene therapies, as well as some of the approved non-viral gene therapies. Okay, so first, what is a non-viral vector? And I think in order to introduce this topic, we need to understand what gene therapy is. So I apologize, this slide got a little uh, out of sorts, but. Gene therapy is a class of pharmaceuticals that uses nucleic acid drugs to treat a medical condition. And this is a very general um, definition that includes a lot of different classes of potential drugs. Um, when we talk about the history of gene therapy, I think it has to start with the recognition of the laws of heredity by Mendel and the isolation of nuclein by Meischer, and then get into um, this field of understanding that um, DNA is the genetic material, that we have genetic regulation of one region by another region in the genome, and then the structure of DNA by Franklin, Watson, and Crick. And then in the 70s, um, recombinant DNA really came of age. And that just means that we can cut and paste different DNA sequences together. And so the first patient was treated with a um, experimental gene therapy back in 1990. There were some um, setbacks in the field, and then the first gene therapy drugs were approved um, in the last decade, and now we're seeing um, an increasing pace of those approvals. So um, a major setback in the field of gene therapy was these um, deaths that occurred in clinical trials from the first generation of viral vectors. So in 1999, there was a trial for ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, and an adenoviral vector was administered, and then um, there was a reaction to that that was uh, very severe with a massive cytokine storm. In 2003, there was a trial for XSCID, um, and this involved a retroviral vector that inserted in front of the LMO2 oncogene and happened to cause leukemia in those patients. So um, there was kind of in the 2000s a recognition that maybe we should um, explore options outside of viral vectors for gene therapy. And a lot of that was motivated by safety concerns. So non-viral gene therapy is um, that same definition, but just without the use of viral vectors. 
And so unfortunately, it's kind of defined by what it is not, which is a funny place to be, but it's a catch-all for all gene therapies that don't use viral vectors. And what we mean by that is that they have either DNA or RNA components in them, but they don't have a capsid involved. So um, the capsid is kind of how I personally would define a, a non-viral vector or a viral vector. So um, this, is com this slide is comparing some of the um, differences between viral vectors and non-viral vectors. Um, a major difference is the cost. So whereas viral vectors can cost, um, you know, many, many thousands of dollars, non-viral vectors, um, specifically the COVID vaccine, can, has cost at, as low as a dollar a dose. So um, although the typical non-viral vector is going to be much more than that, I think um, non-viral vectors do have the potential to cost very little. The likelihood of an immune response is lower for non-viral vectors. The risk of creating a self-replicating agent is simply not there. Um, existing host immunity, interestingly, um, we used to say that there was no existing host immunity, but Matt Porteous's lab showed that um, there can be some antibodies to the Cas9 protein, for instance. So I would say at this point, we don't really know um, exactly what the host immunity is for every single non-viral vector out there, but it's likely to be somewhat lower than we see for viral vectors. The um, transgene size is a major limitation in viral vectorology, whereas for non-viral vectors, depending on the delivery method, sometimes there really isn't a, a transgene limit. In fact, piggyback can integrate up to 200 um, kilobases of DNA. The promoter choice um, can be limited for some viral vectors, and for non-viral vectors, there's a little bit more freedom um, for the promoter choice. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the non-viral vectors that are out there. And I think this has to begin with a discussion of plasmid DNA and what are the different parts of a plasmid. Um, so here you can see PCDNA 3.1 slash CO, that's just the name of this plasmid. A lot of these start with the letter P because that means plasmid. Um, below that is the size of this plasmid. So 5.0 KB means 5,000 base pairs of, uh, new, of DNA. These have to have certain um, things in them so that they can be replicated in bacteria. So this plasmid has a puck origin of replication or ORI, and that's where the um, manufacturing in the, in the bacterial cell begins replication of that DNA. And then we also have the ampicillin resistance gene. So this is a protein that's made in bacteria that lets the bacteria survive in the presence of ampicillin. And that's important because um, you need some kind of drug resistance gene to grow plasmids in bacteria so that they um, we can kill off all the bacteria that don't actually have the plasmid and increase the yield um, of the plasmid prep. So another component you can see is the PCMV. That's the CMV promoter. So this is a viral promoter, um, cytomegalovirus promoter. And this promoter could really um, be either viral or an endogenous promoter, a promoter that comes from the mammalian genome somewhere. That is followed by um, a multiclonal region here. So these are all different restriction enzyme names and each of those sites is present in this plasmid so that you could cut the plasmid open and paste in your gene of interest. So in a gene therapy situation, this would most likely be the missing gene um, that someone has a mutated copy of that needs correction. That's followed by a polyadenylation sequence. So this is a um, sequence that when it's made into RNA, gives a signal in the cell that this is a messenger RNA that is supposed to be there. Um, and should not be degraded. So all of these parts are very important um, and are present in most plasmids. Now, I mentioned the bacterial regions of the plasmid. Um, those are, uh, sorry, I, miss, I forgot this slide. Um, so this slide is on nuclear import and the nuclear import of the plasmid is very sequence dependent. So sometimes you may wanna put things on the plasmid that can help send the plasmid to the nucleus. This is um, data from David Dean's lab, and they micro-injected various cell types from different um, sources 
with a plasmid that's labeled in green. And so you can see that um, different kinds of cells will transport plasmids with different efficiencies. And then that transport is sequence dependent. So the choice of the uh, vector backbone really does matter quite a bit. Um, and then this next slide is talking about the bacterial backbone removal. So there is a process that can be done where um, you can recombine this parental plasmid and create from it a mini circle plasmid. And that mini circle would just have the um, promoter, the gene of interest, and the um, polyadenylation signal, and it would be missing the components of the bacterial backbone. And so when you take out that bacterial backbone, um, it actually increases the expression from the mini circle quite a bit. And so I've seen, you know, data where out to six months or more, you still have pretty high levels of transgene expression coming from these mini circles. Okay, but whether it's a mini circle or a typical plasmid, um, if the cell is dividing quickly, then the episomal plasmid DNA can be lost. So, um, so this is just a simplistic diagram showing that if um, during each cell division, the plasmid is, is going to kind of be equally divided between daughter cells. And then at some point, you may reach this point where there's no plasmid left in these the cells' daughter cells, right? So um, integration of DNA into the genomic DNA is a viable strategy to increase long-term gene expression for the life of the cell and all the daughter cells. And there are a couple of different um, methods of doing that. So transposases and integrases can add sequences into the genome. Nuclease systems work a little bit differently um, where you are um, either nicking or cutting the genomic DNA, and then the host repair machinery is going to somehow remedy that. And one of the ways it can remedy that is if there is a homologous sequence present, then it will um, actually repair from this template that's provided. And that in that way, you can change a mutation back. So each of these systems is different, but they do have a lot of similarities. So in each case, you would need to get in uh, some kind of donor plasmid. And you would also need to introduce a enzyme. So either the transposase and integrase or nuclease, right? And then they have different mechanisms, which I'll get into. Um, but at the end of the day, what you're left with is a modified genome, modified genomic DNA. Okay. So how do engineered transposon systems work? So as I mentioned, you have to introduce a transposon plasmid and then somehow make the transposase. And probably the simplest way to do that is to introduce transposase on a plasmid, but it could also be introduced as um, an mRNA or even as a protein. So in the typical case where you're introducing the transposase on a plasmid, the transposase would be made and then it would bind to the ends of the, um, the, the inverted repeat sequences it would cut the transposon out and then paste it into the genomic DNA. So in engineered systems, this transposon contains a transgene of interest. That would be a marker gene, could be a drug resistance gene. It could be your um, gene therapy kind of gene that you're adding to help someone make a protein that they're not making. One of the ways that we um, can see how efficient different integrating systems such as transposons are is by using a very simple um, drug resistance screen. So we call this a colony count assay. And we would introduce these with, let's say we can test a change that occurs in the transposase sequence or in the inverted repeat sequences, and then um, introduce these into uh, cells by a typical transfection method. And then we can um, use a drug to select for cells that are carrying that transposon with the drug resistance gene. And so, um, for instance, without transposase, you may get very few colonies that randomly integrated, whereas with the transposase, you would get many more colonies. And this slide is just showing what that looks like um, in real life. This is 
a plate, a 10 centimeter dish on which um, mammalian cells were plated. And then we added a drug um, to see how many of those cells are carrying that drug resistance gene. And you can see here, um, some of those are stained in methylene blue, but in the presence of a transposase such as piggyback, you have a very, very high um, number of drug resistant cells that are present. So some of the engineered transposon systems that are out there include Sleeping Beauty, Piggyback, and TC Buster, and there are many others. But I just want to point out that these are all um, kind of on different branches of the phylogenetic tree, the tree of life in a, in a way. So here you're seeing um, various domains of each of these proteins and how they line up. Um, and you can see they're, they're quite different. So these end up having kind of different mechanisms, different crystal structures, many differences. One of the things that they have in common is this um, DDE or um, piggyback has a DDD uh, catalytic triad. So those are the amino acids that are actually necessary in order to cut and paste the DNA. Another thing I wanted to point out is that um, when, when you're supplying these systems, it can matter how much of the transposase is given versus the transposon. And it's not always obvious. So for instance, in this assay, um, I was comparing a few different transposon systems. And you can see that even when I add more transposase, it doesn't actually increase the colony count as opposed to um, more transposon. So I would say for each of these, it kind of needs to be determined um, how much to add, if that ratio should be one to one, or if it might even be better to have an excess of transposon as opposed to transposase. <clears throat> so another difference between these, oh, that's not showing up. Okay, well, I'll just talk about it. So another difference between these various systems is that um, they're, they integrate into different uh, places in the DNA. So they have different preferences for open versus closed chromatin, for instance. So um, piggyback likes to integrate near transcription start sites and in open chromatin regions. And so that leads to very high gene expression. Um, Sleeping Beauty, on the other hand, doesn't like to go near transcription start sites. And so that makes it perhaps a little safer if you were delivering something that could be a concern for oncogenic transformation. So these all have um, their own unique um, features. Another feature of transposon systems is that they can be delivered in multiplex. That means you could deliver multiple transposons to the same cell at the same time. So in this paper, um, three different piggyback transposons were uh, integrated expressing four genes. And so here you can see um, the expression levels of each of those four genes. And then in order for them to, to make this electrical signal here happen, they all have to form a complex. And so this is just showing that those um, four genes delivered on three piggyback transposons were able to be expressed and come together in a cell to have a biological effect that was significant enough to be measured. Okay, so um, that's my, my bit about transposons. And now we're going to change and talk a little bit about um, integrase systems. So FIC31 integrase is the most classical of these um, serine recombinase systems for use in mammalian cells. And the way it works is a donor plasmid is modified to carry this um, DNA attachment site and the integrase is able to bind to this DNA attachment site on the donor plasmid, as well as um, pseudo attachment sites in the genomic DNA. So these are sites that are already there in the genomic DNA. They don't have to be placed. And FICE31 is able to find them. And then it um, forms a complex and integrates this entire donor plasmid into the genomic DNA. And so whereas uh, transposon integrating systems are a little bit more random, um, the integrase systems are inherently sequence specific because that binding of the enzyme to the DNA needs to be just right in order to get that reaction to occur. So back in the um, 2000s, it was determined that 
approximately 60% of FICE 31 integrations occurred at the top 19 sites. And then although, you know, a statistical distribution would predict um, almost over 300 sites, there were probably very, very much fewer in vivo um, because this is influenced by genomic context. So as I was alluding to with transposons, it really does matter what state the, the DNA is. And you can imagine if the DNA is um, being bound by other things, then those can get in the way. Um, one thing that's also important to note about these systems is that for FICE-31 integrase, at least, we don't require cell division for integration. So this is a section of a mouse liver. Um, the mouse was given um, something to label the DNA during um, cell division. And so if, if the cell did divide, then the nucleus would be purple. And you can see there are some cells that are both purple and green, um, that meaning that they got the transgene and they divided during that week after gene delivery. But there are many cells that are blue, that have a blue nucleus. So those um, did not divide and they received the transgene. Um, FICE-31 integrase is just one of many different serine, large serine recombinases that can be utilized for genomic integration in mammalian cells. Um, and another really good one is BXB1, but BXB1 isn't very good at finding its own pseudocytes in the genome. So BXB1 can be utilized in a different way using a landing pad because it's so specific. So um, this is a paper from nucleic acids research from 2014. And in this paper, um, Michelle Kalis's group, they, they used human ES cells and IPS cells, and they placed a landing pad at a known location. And this could give you the opportunity to test many different genes against each other in a very controlled way at the same site in the genomic DNA. So more recently, um, Patrick Seuss group did this uh, very large computational screen to find new large serine recombinases. And um, this is only possible in recent years because we have you know, 200, nearly 200,000 genomes sequenced. So there's a lot more of these um, recombinases that are out there that are ready to be discovered at this point. Um, and so they compared, they found the, the at B and at P sites, and then they blasted those against the human genome so that they could um, determine which ones may have the potential to be utilized, kind of how FICE-31 integrase was. And then this is from their supplemental data, but I think it's very important. This is showing one of those large serine recombinases, CP36, and it had high integration activity in human cells. Um, and so in this assay, they integrated a gene that makes M-cherry protein, which is red, which is easy to pick up um, using fax uh, technology. So, so essentially, you know, 30% of these cells had an integration event that resulted in gene expression um, nearly two weeks after transfection. So, um, and that was only in the presence of the large serine recombinase. Um, if you don't have CP36 there, then you don't have that integration event and none of the cells are still red. So um, I think there's a, a large potential now to um, find these large serine recombinases and then further optimize them um, for integration. Okay, so the next category of um, genome modifying non-viral enzymes would be the nucleases. So these were originally uh, discovered as meganucleases. So kind of like those restriction enzymes that I pointed out in the plasmid multiclonal multi site, um, there are meganucleases that have a very long uh, sequence of nucleotides that they need in order to read. To, and so these can work in mammalian cells. And a lot of the um, methods about how to repair double strand breaks were deciphered using these. So then um, zinc finger nucleases were discovered, followed by talons, and then CRISPR-Cas system. So each of these rely on cellular mechanisms for repair. Um, so they make a gene disruption, and then if there's non-homologous enjoining present, then the most likely outcome is disruption of the gene. If homology-directed homology repair machinery is present in that cell, 
then you could um, either supply homologous sequences that are flanking a new gene for gene addition, or you could supply a homologous sequence that would correct a gene mutation. So in this way, um, I think nucleases have a lot of power to actually um, just make very small changes in the genome. So zinc finger nucleases were interesting because unlike meganucleases, you do have some user control of the site that is going to be bound by the zinc finger protein. So these get kind of layered up in multiple fingers and each of those fingers it's known which nucleic acids they're going to bind. They do require a lot of um, empirical determination to figure out which ones are going to work best. So it has to be tested in cells. Talons were an interesting discovery because the talons have a code that makes it a little bit easier to do the user, user designed um, site selection. So you can see there's here two of these variable dye residues that will tell the protein to bind this particular nucleic acid, right? And then finally, um, CRISPR-Cas systems allow for truly user-guided um, binding. So, so there's a guide RNA, gRNA here, which will uh, base pair with the DNA sequence. And then Cas9, when it, when it senses that that is happening, it will cleave um, the genome. And so Cas9 is the most classic of these. There's many, many more. They all have uh, different PAM sequences. This NGG here is required for Cas9. That's, that's called a, a PAM. Um, those can be different for different ones. We also have now Cas9s that have been mutated so that they don't actually cut the DNA, but those can be fused to other domains to do different functions in cells. Okay, so this figure is just showing um, the same thing that, that you, you can either do gene disruption or gene editing using this kind of system. And there are many different options for gene editing. Uh, some of these are utilized more in a biotechnology context, for instance, um, flanking an exon with LOX P site. So you could make a mouse that will have that exon gone in the presence of Cree recombinase. Um, others have a gene therapy application, um, but I think they're very powerful. The latest is prime editing, where um, that binding domain is then fused to something else that can modify the nucleotide in a very precise way and just change the one base pair. So I think these are um, an amazing addition to the non-viral gene therapy um, overall toolbox. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some of these smaller nucleotides that affect the RNA inside of cells. So we have um, antisense oligonucleotides, um, small interfering RNAs. These can be used to disrupt a gene or knock it down. And then mRNA drugs or vaccines. Um, these are longer pieces of RNA that can be introduced. And so um, we've all now gotten the COVID vaccine and that would be included here. Aptamers are sort of um, enzymes that can bind to different things. They're, they're RNA that can be configured in a certain way and that can inhibit an enzyme or it can actually do some chemical reactions itself. Um, and so this is another slide just detailing how these different RNA therapies work. So RNA interference relies on dicer and risk to um, degrade a targeted piece of mRNA. Um, Antisense RNA can be used to change splice patterns. So a big use of this is to change the um, production of a finished mRNA. RNA aptamers, here it's showing binding to a protein and blocking the function and then mRNA um, introduced into the cell undergoes translation, and then either a functional enzyme or an antigen is produced, such as for the COVID vaccine. So the last of these I wanna talk about are exosomes. Um, these are sort of a natural nanoparticle, if you will, and these contain nucleic acid, mostly in the form of RNA. Um, they also contain amino acids and proteins, 
it's all contained in a lipid bilayer. And then on the outside of that are many of these transmembrane domains. And those help define an exosome as such. And they also can be used for targeting um, of these exosomes to a particular tissue. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the non-viral delivery methods um, that we have. So let's start with um, what is the difference between in vivo versus ex vivo gene therapy? So in vivo gene therapy just means that you're giving the drug directly to the patient by any number of routes that's possible. Ex vivo gene therapy means that cells are derived from the patient or from a donor, and then those are modified in a dish and given back to the patient as the therapeutic. So this is a, from a review from 2019, and it covers um, a lot of these different um, approved gene therapies. And so I just want to point out that, you know, over half of these that are for in vivo gene therapy are actually non-viral. And so um, there's obviously been a advantage in some way to, to doing non-viral. Um, and then as far as ex vivo goes, there are a number of clinical trials that I'm aware of where they're making um, CAR-T or other therapeutics utilizing transposons and other kinds of non-viral methods of integration in place of a retrovirus. So this slide is um, from this excellent review by Yong Kook Kim that was published in Experimental Molecular Medicine in 2022. And it shows um, how some of these different RNA delivery, me delivery uh, methods work and how they get into um, the cell and how they're administered therapeutically. And so um, this review really goes through each of these in great detail. And so I would invite you, if you're interested in one of these, to really look at this review. But um, as I mentioned, for antisense oligonucleotide therapeutics, they can either work by blocking or by changing the splice pattern. Um, and so if you're not familiar with our mRNA splicing, um, there's basically different sections of RNA that have to get put together. And if they're being put together um, in a way that's making a mutant protein, sometimes we can um, sort of introduce one of these and help the cell to put it together in a way that will make a functional protein. For small interfering RNA therapeutics, these are all going to help knock down the gene. So unlike CRISPR-Cas, which actually knocks out a gene, um, these are just reducing the amount of protein nearly completely. Um, so there is going to be still a very small amount of protein made, but these can be highly effective. And then Aptamer therapeutic, um, this particular drug, uh, pegaptamib, it binds to VEGF, and then that will help uh, prevent cell proliferation from binding to the VEGF receptor. I think mRNA, mRNA therapeutics and vaccines, we've now seen the power of an mRNA vaccine um, in real life. And so there are some big advantages to um, utilizing these nucleic acid therapeutics as opposed to a more traditional vaccine. And I think we all saw how much faster it was. Um, the speed of production is very important. And um, these can be made very quickly. And um, I hope that in the future, these can also be made in a more personalized medicine, customized kind of version for patients with specific mutations. So this is from that same review, and this is a list of the um, approved non-viral RNA therapeutics. So how are these um, delivered into cells? There are a number of different vehicle materials um, for chemical delivery. So polymers, there are non-biodegradable and biodegradable polymers. For the lipids, there's more conventional ones, and then there's also these um, Gemini surficants, um, lipidoids, and helper lipids. There are peptides that can be attached. Um, so you can make a peptide nucleic acid kind of conjugate. There's also polypeptides and functional peptides, and then a number of inorganic materials. So these make nanoparticles, um, silica, gold, magnetic, carbon nanotube, um, and other kinds of these nanoparticles or quantum dots. 
And then hybrid systems. So one of the advantages with non-viral is because we're not working with a capsid that has its own constraints, um, you can really mix and match different parts of chemical delivery, physical delivery, and the vector system itself in various ways. So I think that's where um, there's nearly an infinite number of uh, therapeutics that could be imagined, um, but they do need to be tested empirically to make sure they actually work. So these are just some of the commercial transfection reagents that we typically use in the lab. Um, and these are available just off the shelf for transfection. Um, I would say if, if you're, as things advance toward a gene therapy, you always need to work with a lab that kind of focuses on these and um, can add and subtract different uh, parts of the molecules so that you can get a specific gene delivery. Some of the physical methods of gene delivery that um, I want to mention briefly are hydrodynamic delivery, ultrasound microbubbles, and electroporation. So I've used hydrodynamic delivery extensively in my work, and um, it works by delivering naked DNA. So it's usually not conjugated to anything. And then um, you just do a very fast injection that creates a high pressure in the vasculature and pushes the DNA into uh, mostly hepatocytes if it's administered systemically to a mouse, for instance. But in larger animals, catheters are used so that you can create high pressure in a specific area um, in an organ. So here this is showing, uh, this is from Matt Wilson's lab, combining hydrodynamic delivery with piggyback transposons. And these mice are still expressing the transgene at 300 days after gene delivery. And this review um, by Desi Liu's group, it talks about um, all the different studies that have been done. And um, we've done some in kidney, and there are many other kinds of um, organs that have been tried. I think it's most effective for liver, kidney, and muscle, but there are others as well. Okay, and um, this figure is from Carol Miao's group. Um, these are ultrasound microbubbles, which are um, they can have different formulations again, um, but the key thing is the combination of the microbubble with the ultrasound, which is focused on the area of interest. And so that can cause those microbubbles to burst in a way and actually transfect the nearby tissues. So this is a pig liver, um, and you can see the hepatic vein here, and the highest levels of protein expression near that um, delivered gene. Okay, so finally, electroporation. Um, it's just the application of an electric field across a cell. So this is used in many different contexts. Um, there is an electroporation that doesn't involve a gene therapy as well called NanoKnife that's approved, which does this irreversible electroporation to tumors. And it leaves many of the um, normal structures nearby intact. And so in that way, it can kill the tumor without killing most of this normal tissue. Um, for gene therapy purposes, you want to introduce um, the electricity along with a molecule such as DNA or RNA, and that can be um, introduced into cells that way. So electroporation has been used in vivo for muscle, heart, and skin, eye, many different uh, tissues. And um, there are also lots of commercial ex vivo electroporation systems available. Um, the latest are kind of the MAC site for flow electroporation and Lonzo 4D. Um, and these are being utilized heavily for T cells. So um, I finally just want to talk about the importance of optimizing uh, transfection of the cells and really coming up with the best delivery method for your cell type. So this is just an example of, of one cell type, where it just so happened that Fujin 6, for instance, worked much better than lipofectin in 2000. But I've got other graphs that show the exact opposite. So each cell type is, is different. And it's important to test this in a really controlled way by getting all the cells ready at the same time, um, using the same plasmid, and then um, using facts or another method to look at the percentage of live um, cells that have the transgene, and just be very careful about selection of um, the method of transfection. Okay, so um, 
I've covered a lot in 40 minutes. I, I realize I can't cover everything and each of these slides could be its own lunch and learn. Um, but I hope I've given you a, an overview of all of the different um, non-viral vectors and methods um, that are out there. And I want to acknowledge um, my graduate mentor, Michelle Kalos, and my postdoc mentor, Matt Wilson, um, with whom I worked on integrase and transposon systems. Um, we have a really excellent non-viral therapeutic delivery scientific committee at ASGCT that I'm honored to be a part of. Um, right now, our chair is Lori Heller, who works on electroporation. Um, but I want to thank all the members of that past and present, and we recently renamed it. So it now has um, a more simple title that should help you all. Um, I want to thank members of my lab for their help and support and my faculty mentoring committee. So at Vanderbilt, we have a mentoring committee until we get tenure, um, and they are excellent at helping me. Um, and then I want to thank our funders, including especially the VA, who um, is my major funder, as well as ASGCT and the sponsors of this Lunch and Learn for the opportunity to talk to you all. And feel free to email me if you have any follow-up questions um, and follow me on Twitter. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Woodard, for this wonderful and educational uh, presentation. I personally have learned a lot. So let's see if there are questions from the audience uh, regarding your presentation. All right, it seems that we have a shy audience, so I can go first with uh, some questions I, I actually had. And you were discussing a little bit uh, RNA therapeutics, which seem to be the lead non-viral uh, pharmaceuticals right now, right? So I was wondering with your experience on transposases and integrases, like what do you think uh, is missing on the end to, to reach the same uh, level of uh, success therapies and how close are those therapies from there? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think some of the RNA therapeutics were a little bit simpler in that it's, it can be a very short um, sequence of nucleic acids, so they're really not as um, complex. They also don't have the same safety concerns because they don't typically, I mean, they can't integrate into the genome, whereas um, the transposon and integrase systems are, you know, on a practical level, most closely related to a retrovirus because they're, they're integrating into the um genome. So there are a number of companies right now and other clinical trials that are going forward that are using these systems. And um, I mean, we'll just see what happens, but I think they are getting very close to the clinic and they're being heavily utilized for T cells. But I think there are many other applications. Um, and especially when you think about just the, the ease of um, production of a plasmid versus a virus, it could um, lower costs. So I think that's a big advantage. But yes, I think they have more, they have more safety concern. There's a little bit of a different complexity there as opposed to the RNA therapeutics. I see. And uh, related to that, um, how far has been the insertional mutagenesis risk uh, been studied for those kind of therapies? Because uh, as you know, with lentiviral vectors, is something that the regulatory agencies ask for. Is that something that uh, you usually look for? Yeah, I think that's very a very important point. Um, so during my PhD thesis, we were very concerned about FIC31 integrase um, because in tissue culture, we saw that there could be chromosomal translocations that were actually... Um, mediated by the integrase. So we were concerned and did a um, study in liver where we had mice that they were predisposed to get liver cancer. And then we saw if they got cancer faster in the presence of the therapeutic or not. And we, you know, used different parts of that therapeutic to kind of try to figure out if the integrase was able to accelerate oncogenesis meaning the, the mice would get cancer faster. And actually it wasn't. So we, we didn't see that acceleration in the presence of the integrase. Um, whereas I think, you know, each, each of these kind of needs to be tested on its own um, and 
in some ways we won't know until they are in the clinic exactly what the safety risks are. Um, but again, just like with viral vectors, there are many steps that can be taken that could make these safer. Um, for instance, including insulators, if the gene, the promoter is very strong, things like that. So there are many, um, I, I like to view uh, gene therapy design as kind of an engineering process where we design and build and test and we keep coming back around. So I think there are ways to make them safer. They also need to be studied um, extensively in systems like that. Absolutely. So it seems we have a question from the audience that is, uh, which of transposase integrase and nuclease has the least uh, of target integration? Oh, yeah, that's a, well, that's a good question. So with transposases, um, they have very short nucleotide sequences that they're, that they're recognizing naturally. So for instance, Sleeping Beauty can integrate into a TA dinucleotide sequence. So those are all over the genome. So they're sort of not um, targeted naturally. Now, um, people have fused transposases to a DNA binding domain such as the zinc fingers, the towels, or the dead Cas9, so Cas9 that can't cut the DNA. Um, and that's that works to some extent. It um, The problem is you still have off-target integration that's pretty high. Um, so of those three, I would say it's between maybe an integrase and a nuclease. Um, the integrase... I mean, I'm not quite sure. I think it depends on the case. It would depend on which integrase we're talking about. It would depend on which nuclease we're talking about. Um, but definitely transposons are not very targeted at all. So they would have the most off-target integration, if you want to call it that. Okay. And then I was you were discussing the different delivery systems that nowadays most of them are or at least the most widely used are based on lipid particles right and uh, i would like to to know what's your opinion and um, if you can comment on the other uh delivery systems that you saw to us uh on your experience if there are other options maybe the hybrids i don't know that you think uh, can be as good uh, or or even better than lipid nanoparticles yeah um so lipid nanoparticles have been around for a while. I think they work great for um, typical biology kind of processes where we're transfecting cells. They're the most simple ones. You don't need a special machine to use those. Um, there are lipid changes in the lipids that can be made to make them more specific for different cell types in vivo, for instance. But I think some of the, um, you know, like conjugating to a protein for targeting or um, some of the even inorganic nanoparticles, those can give a little bit more organ specificity in a way. So um, each of these, I think, should be explored in its own right. And um, depending on the organ that you're interested in targeting, there may be a better or worse choice for those. Um, but yeah, there are many labs that, that work exclusively on these and I'm not one of them so I I may not know everything about nanoparticles but um all right thank you so much and um it seems that we don't have further questions again if you come up with questions you can always reach out directly to Dr. Woodard um then uh, I just want to Thank you again, Dr. Woodard, for giving a great overview of nonviral vectors. And I want to thank our audience for attending this session. Uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so please fill out the brief three minute survey uh, link that is in the chat, or I guess it will pop up soon, uh, or by scanning the QR code on, on your screen with the phone. And then I think the recording of this session will be available on the ASCCT patient education site early next week where you can also find all the previous lunch and learns along with a whole library of Gene Therapy 101s and this is specific content that is free for you all to access and share. So finally, uh, I just wanna inform you that there will be a break in our lunch and learn sessions for the next few months, but we'll be back again on August. So please join us. And thank you again, everyone uh, for joining us and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thanks. Bye, thanks, Carmen. Thank you.